Everyone expected the F-35 to ace the Arctic test. It's stealth. It's fifth generation. It's supposed to be unbeatable. But when the results came back, it wasn't the American jet making headlines. It was Sweden's Gripen E, a jet everyone thought was too small, too simple, too cheap. Quietly passing a test, the F-35 failed. In the frozen skies of northern Canada, where the air is thin and temperatures can kill in minutes, the Royal Canadian Air Force runs some of the harshest cold weather trials on Earth. It's a place where machinery is stripped to its bones, where technology either works or it doesn't. And that's exactly where Saab decided to bring the Gripen E, a fighter born from a country that knows cold. While the F-35 struggled with sensor glitches, engine heating issues, and maintenance delays in extreme weather, the Gripen E took off, landed, and turned around, again and again, as if it were on a summer runway. That wasn't luck. That was design. See, Sweden never built the Gripen E for desert wars or long carrier deployments. They built it for survival, to fight above snow, ice, and endless forests, where one wrong decision could mean losing your country. The US built a global empire jet. Sweden built a home defender. And in Canada, that difference mattered. Back in 2017, Canada launched one of the biggest fighter replacement programs in modern history. The goal, replace its aging CF-18 Hornets with a new generation of fighters ready for Arctic operations and NATO commitments. The US offered the F-35, sleek, stealthy, and politically irresistible. But Sweden's Saab entered the race with something completely different, the Gripen E, a single-engine fighter that could take off from a frozen road, refuel from a truck, and be turned around by a team of just five conscripts in under 10 minutes. Critics laughed. How could this light Scandinavian jet compete with the world's most advanced stealth fighter? They called it outdated. They called it underpowered. They called it a backup plan. But in the Arctic, reality doesn't care about prestige. When Canada's evaluation teams began testing for cold weather reliability and maintenance speed, the Gripen didn't just perform, it thrived. Its systems started up instantly even in deep sub-zero temperatures. Its open architecture allowed quick fixes and software updates on the spot. And perhaps most importantly, it didn't need a hangar full of technicians or specialized tools. Meanwhile, the F-35, well, let's just say it didn't enjoy the cold. During several Arctic trials across North America and Europe, the F-35 faced recurring issues, battery faults in extreme cold, canopy freezing problems, and a ground maintenance system so fragile it often slowed operations instead of speeding them up. It was a reminder that stealth coatings and supercomputers mean nothing if your jet can't start on a winter morning. That's when Canada began to notice something. The Gripen E wasn't just cheaper, it was simpler, smarter, and built for the same climate Canadians live and train in every day. It could operate from remote northern bases or even highways if runways were bombed. Its engine, the GEF-414, had proven reliability in harsh conditions. And its electronic warfare suite, the Arexis system, could jam, deceive, and survive even the most complex radar environments. No stealth paint, no billion-dollar logistics chain, just a jet that works. But this story isn't just about cold weather. It's about independence. Because behind Canada's fighter competition lies a deeper question, one that goes beyond hardware. Who do you want to depend on when the world starts to fracture? Buying the F-35 ties Canada completely to U.S. systems, U.S. maintenance, and U.S. politics. Every upgrade, every spare part, every line of code controlled south of the border. Sweden's Gripen offered something the U.S. never could, sovereignty. Saab promised full technology transfer. Canadian engineers could maintain, modify, even upgrade the jet themselves. No foreign approval needed. That promise, freedom to control your own air power, was the quiet revolution in this story. Of course, the politics were never going to make it easy. Washington pushed hard for the F-35, leveraging decades of defense cooperation. It was the NATO standard, the Western favorite, the jet everyone was supposed to buy. But behind closed doors, some in the Royal Canadian Air Force saw the results of those Arctic tests and started whispering a dangerous thought. What if the Gripen actually fits Canada better? 
It wasn't a fantasy. Brazil had already bought it. Finland nearly did. And now, Canada had the data to prove it wasn't just marketing. Then came the moment that turned whispers into headlines. During an interoperability test focused on cold weather response and data link operations, the Gripen E's mission system synced seamlessly with NATO platforms. While the F-35 experienced multiple connection drops due to temperature-related equipment faults, the Swedes called it routine, the Canadians called it impressive, the Americans called it unexpected. In short, the Gripen E passed a test that exposed one of the F-35's biggest weaknesses. It's a brilliant jet in theory, but a delicate one in reality. And that's what made the story so poetic. A jet from a country of 10 million people, with a defense budget smaller than Canada's, had just proven it could outlast the most expensive aircraft ever built by mankind. While others spent trillions to dominate the skies, Sweden quietly mastered how to survive them. So what happens now? Officially, Canada has already committed to the F-35 program, but unofficially, the conversation isn't over. Pilots talk, technicians compare notes, and in every corner of the RCF, there's a growing respect for what the Gripen E accomplished. Because the truth is, in real operations, it's not about who has the flashiest jet, it's about who can get airborne first, stay flying longer, and fight without asking permission. From the Canadian Arctic to the Baltic Sea, that idea is spreading fast. Finland's Air Force now trains alongside Gripen's for interoperability. Brazil's squadrons are developing tactics that exploit the jet's networked agility. Even US analysts, the same ones who once mocked the cheap Swedish fighter, are starting to admit that maybe, just maybe, the world needs fewer gold-plated solutions and more clever ones. Because if the Gripen E could outperform the F-35 in the one environment designed to break everything, it's not just a win for Sweden. It's a warning shot to everyone else. Maybe this wasn't supposed to happen. Maybe the underdog wasn't supposed to come this far. But every generation has that one moment when the smaller, smarter player forces the giants to rethink what matters. For aviation, this was one of those moments. The Gripen E didn't just pass a test in Canada. It passed a truth test about what modern air power should be. In the end, Sweden didn't build the most advanced jet on the planet. They built the most adaptable. The one that proves you don't need to be a superpower to protect your skies. You just need to be smart enough to use your environment as your advantage. In a world full of billion dollar hangars and endless maintenance delays, that's a revolution in itself. Because sometimes the cold doesn't break the machine. It reveals the truth behind it. And in those frozen skies over Canada, the truth belonged to the Gripen E.